Uh, we're going to spend time in God's Word, um, so John's going to come preach a bit. If you'd like to get your Bibles out, uh, they're in the back of your uh, pew. We're just going to look at a few verses as um, this morning in Romans 8, it's on page 1135. Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Amen. John. Are we on? Yes, we're on. Good morning. Well, let's just pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that through the Spirit, you teach us your word. You reveal who you are. And we ask this morning that by your Holy Spirit, you will reveal even more of yourself. Amen. Well, we're continuing uh, today, that sounds quite loud, am I very loud? Very loud. (laughs) We're continuing today our series um, on the person and the power um, of the Holy Spirit and how he's active in our world and our lives. And we're kind of starting at the beginning. We're starting with the question, so how is the Holy Spirit involved when someone becomes a Christian? How does that actually work? Um, What does it even mean? to say that we've become a Christian. Um, What does that mean? Um, And perhaps if we're brave this morning, we might ask ourselves the question, am I actually a Christian? (laughs) Um, That's kind of the agenda for this morning. And and what does the Holy Holy Spirit have to do with this mystery of what it means to be a Christian? Um, I don't like to use the word conversion or convert Um, It's not actually a word, I think it's a word that's used once in the Bible, convert. Um, It's not actually a word that is used all that often in the scriptures. Um, And for me, it has some kind of slightly uh, difficult connotations now, I think, the word conversion or convert. Um, So it's something that I I, I like to try and get away from if I can. And I don't think it's a, a, a word that's used often in the scriptures. The problem with the word convert Um, in the English language is, um, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says something like this, a person who has been persuaded to change their religious faith or other belief. That's the definition of a convert. Someone who has been persuaded to change their faith or their belief. And for me, the implication of that is that becoming a Christian is somehow an intellectual exercise. It's an exercise in persuasion rather than a supernatural transformation. You with me? Okay, so I don't like the word conversion for that reason. Um, You know, the danger is, if we're not careful, is we start to strip out the central role of the Holy Spirit from the whole process. And it just becomes a kind of intellectual decision that people make, rather than something that is a miracle that is a power of the Spirit action. And I believe in the goodness of Christ. I believe in the intellectual integrity of his moral teachings. Absolutely. Absolutely believe in all of that. But I don't believe that becoming a Christian is about weighing up my options and deciding that the Christian story makes the most logical sense out of everything that's kind of on the menu. 
I don't believe that's what it means to be a Christian. Because the thing is, it really, really doesn't. It doesn't. This Christian story, stripped back to just an intellectual proposition, does not make the most sense out of all the options out there. I hope I can say that in church. And the reason why I feel I can say that in church is because Paul says it in 1 Corinthians, doesn't he? Paul is a much brighter man than me. And he says this. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It makes no sense. He says later that it was not about his eloquence or his superior wisdom that the Corinthian church became Christians. He said it was nothing to do with that. It was because of a demonstration of the Spirit's power that the church in Corinth ever came to exist. It was the Spirit's power that did the work. Yes? Spirit's power does the work. So we must be under no illusion. And this is important for me because I like words and I like ideas and I like communicating. But for me, it's incredibly humbling to read Paul saying, it was nothing to do with my language or ideas that persuaded you to become Christians. That's, that's actually quite encouraging, Tim, isn't it? Um, we must be under no illusion that it's not about intelligent arguments. It's not about persuasive rhetoric. It's not about musically charged emotional experiences. These are not the things that make people Christians. They're not things that persuade us that we are believers. We should not lead on these things. It is the power of the Spirit alone that changes human hearts. The power of the Spirit alone. Agree? You with me? Good. Excellent. But the work of the Spirit in the human heart is such a deep mystery. It's such a deep mystery, and it's personalized, each one of us. It's deep, and it's personalized. And so it isn't possible for me this morning to kind of adequately define what's going on when the Spirit changes a human heart with simple words. And I think that's true in the Scriptures as well. And Tim and I were talking about this morning. There is no place in the Bible where you can go where it defines what happens in precise language when the Spirit enables a person to become a Christian. There isn't a moment. What you get is a tapestry of imagery throughout the Scriptures that describe what's going on in that process. And if we look very, even very quickly this morning at some of the language that Jesus uses and some of the language that Paul uses, what we start to do is build up a more multi-layered picture of what happens, this wonderful mystery of when the Spirit does his work in our lives. And what I'd like to do this morning is just pick on two metaphors, two images that are in the Scriptures that describe a little bit about how the Spirit works in us when we become Christians. And I'm hoping that that will help us all kind of build a shared understanding of, of what's going on uh, when that takes place. So that's the agenda this morning. I hope that's okay. So first of all, I want to start with the image of rebirth. Rebirth. It's one of the images used in the scriptures to talk about what it means when someone becomes a Christian. Um, lots of churches, lots of Christians use the language to be born again. To be born again which is not the only way of describing what happens, but it's one way of describing what happens, to be born again. And I think it's a good alternative to be converted, to be born again. So what does that mean? So we actually owe much of this vocabulary to the Apostle John rather than to Paul. Um, so if you look at John chapter 3, the Gospel of John, Jesus is teaching, and this is just before the famous John 3.16, for God so loved the world. If you go back a little bit, the beginning of that teaching, Jesus is talking about what it means when someone becomes a follower of Christ. And he says this, he says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That's what Jesus says. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And there's a guy called Nicodemus who's there, and he gets a bit confused, and he says, Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Kind of misses the point that it's a metaphor rather than something that can literally happen. To which Jesus says this. He says that this new birth is of water and spirit, he says, and that the spirit gives birth to spirit. It is a spiritual thing that happens when someone is born again. And later in the letter of 1 John, 
the Apostle John explains this. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. He uses that birth imagery again, that birth language. So I think this is one of our central images this morning. What does it mean to become a Christian? It means to be reborn in some way. It means to be reborn. And I think for Paul, and we're very much focusing on how Paul thinks about the Spirit in this series, Paul never uses that language precisely, but the idea of rebirth and renewal is absolutely central to Paul's understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Absolutely central. And actually, his teaching follows the pattern of Christ, that Christ died and then rose again and was renewed in some way, was renewed. He was both himself and different. And for Paul, he sees the Christian journey as following that pattern. Like Christ, we die to ourselves and then we are renewed or reborn. We are new creations, he says. In 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is reborn, or she is reborn. So it's about renewal or rebirth, being at once ourselves and yet entirely refreshed and transformed. Just like Jesus, who was in the garden outside the tomb, was himself and yet different who on the beach by the Lake of Galilee was himself and yet different. It's the same for us. When we become Christians, we are still ourselves, and yet we are renewed in some incredible, miraculous way. That is what the Spirit does. So we have this idea that it's through the power of the cross that the Holy Spirit provokes and empowers a rebirth in us, a rebirth or a renewal of the believer. Something old has passed away and something new has been brought to life. How wonderful is that, by the way? How wonderful is not that? A rebirth, a renewal. And that's the promise for us this morning. It's great, isn't it, Val? (laughs) You know, it's interesting when you think about the early church, because they were all first-generation believers, weren't they? They were all first-generation believers. So... For them, in a way, it was actually clearer than it is for us because for first-generation Christian to put your trust in Christ, then every new believer was a kind of pioneer. There was no one that had gone before them. They were the first Christians. And so this idea of kind of regeneration or rebirth was probably even clearer for them. There was no kind of centuries of tradition of church going to, to confuse the issue. It was, it was transformational. It was radical. Um, And it was a really fresh, exciting movement. And you can see in the letters of Peter and Paul and others that they're trying to help this early Christian community talk about what's going on. You know, the Holy Spirit's moving, people are being transformed, and they're trying to describe to one another what's actually happening here. And that's what we have, that's what we call the New Testament, this description of what's happening. And you take Paul as an example. His rebirth was incredibly dramatic, wasn't it? Incredibly dramatic, where suddenly he was blinded. Suddenly he was blinded, blinded, his entire life was turned upside down. And so given their story, I think we can see why the idea of rebirth or renewal would be a helpful image to describe what is going on when someone becomes a follower of Jesus. And I know that there are people here this morning who have powerful testimonies about how their lives were turned upside down by the Spirit. Dramatic rebirth dramatic renewal, one day everything changed. Love those testimonies. You know when you go to baptisms and people tell their testimony? I love those testimonies that say, I was going this way, I was blind, I was lost, and suddenly I could see. The work of the Spirit is so powerfully clear, isn't it, in those people's stories. For me, this is actually quite a tricky topic. It makes me feel a little bit insecure because my testimony is really dull. My testimony of faith is really, really boring. You know, I was brought up in a strong Christian household. You know, my dad was a minister. You know, I I can't pinpoint the day when my chains fell off. It's not dramatic in my mind. It's not dramatic. You know, I'm the very definition of a second generation Christian the very definition of a second-generation Christian. You know, there there was no rolling thunder. There were no tongues of fire. There was no obvious miracle to me. 
I heard the gospel throughout my childhood, and as a teenager, I came to accept the truth of what Jesus had done for me. So the Spirit's influence on me, I think, during those days, it was more the gentle whisper than the powerful wind. There was no fire and there was no earthquake. And actually, as a younger Christian, I actually found myself questioning, therefore, whether somehow I'd missed out on something, that I'd missed out on some dramatic spiritual rebirth, or that somehow my faith was less genuine than those stories, you know, people who had, you know, I was a drug dealer, and then I had this near-death experience, and then this miraculous, and I, whoa, you know, super Christian. I used to think, feel a bit inadequate, actually, about my own, my own story. I don't know if any of you relate to this. You know, and I wondered, I used to really worry that my kind of mundane faith revelation, as I saw it, somehow would lead me to lead a less powerful life for Christ. That somehow I wasn't going to be inspired by the Spirit in the same way. It was something that used to really, really bother me. Um, and I could go into more detail, but I'm not going to because of time. But I want to share an idea with you this morning that has helped me. And it's helped me more since becoming a father. Okay? As an expectant parent, the one thing you pray for is that the birth is safe and straightforward. Agreed? Those of you who have been parents or are parents, you just want it to go smoothly, don't you? No complications. You just want it to happen. Now, I'm on slightly dangerous ground here because I'm a man. (laughs) And I was largely a passive observer of the process. Hannah did all the work. Okay? She, you know, I read the paper a little bit. Um, and, and was generally, you know, occasionally get a glass, glass of water. Um, so I'm going to try and describe this, and I'll be a little bit careful. Please don't throw things at me. In our experience, we had one slightly more complicated birth, which was Ben, and then one relatively more straightforward birth, which was Ella, my daughter, son, daughter. Uh, ben was first, Ella was second. And I'm not going to go into the gory details, but... I know for sure, for me, that both births were equally extraordinary, were equally extraordinary. And I was no less elated or proud when Ella popped out after a relatively short process. Hannah told me it was three hours of excruciating pain, but relatively short process, rather than Ben, who came out a bit yellow, struggling for air, It was a protracted induction labor. He had to be whisked away and put in a little oxygen tent. And, you know, he didn't cry when he first was born, and it was a bit nervous and scary. So very, very different experiences. But for me as a father, you know, the occasion of both births were incredibly joyous, equally life-changing, equally wonderful. And so I like to imagine, if we're going to extend this image for a moment, I like to imagine that when it comes to rebirth, that God the Father, in a similar way, rejoices just as much, just as much when one of his children experiences a more straightforward rebirth, just as he rejoices when the spiritual labor is more protracted or complicated, but nevertheless successful. In both cases, it's miraculous. In both cases, the central involvement of the Spirit is powerful, regardless of the complexity of the story. So that's rebirth. It's a very powerful image, isn't it, of what it means to be a Christian. It's a very powerful image and something worth reflecting on this morning about your own experience of rebirth and the Spirit. I'd like to pick up a second connected image that Paul uses, and it's the one that we find in in Romans chapter 8, actually, which is the image of being adopted into God's family. So they're similar but different. And this is part of the kind of multi-layered texture of what happens when someone becomes a Christian, what is going on with the Spirit? And it's not either or, it's both and. And there are many more that we could explore, but we haven't got time. So we read earlier this morning that Paul says, you didn't receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. I'm sure you know that Abba is the kind of Aramaic for dad. And it has that lovely, um, abba, abba, abba. you know, babies, when they're learning to speak, they kind of, they, they, they babble. And that's why da, 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 da. That's why often it's, it's first words for children, because they're easier to say. So you can see that abba, abba, abba. It's that first word of da, 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 da. It's the first thing that a child says to identify a parent as saying, you belong to me and I belong to you. 
That's what that word Abba means, Abba. And Paul says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We are God's children. So what's going on here with the Spirit? When we become Christians, what does that mean? It means we're reborn. It means we're renewed. But also our identity is changed. Our identity is changed. You know, once we're reborn, what happens then? Is it that we're just given a new life and then left to get on with it? No. We are reborn and then we are adopted into God's family. He claims us as his own. How amazing is that? What a wonderful way of thinking about becoming a Christian. You know, I I don't want to diss things like the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course is amazing, okay? Um, And it's great as a kind of way in and get people to talk about, but... You know, doing the Alpha Course doesn't make Christians. The Spirit and the Father and the work of Jesus on the cross and the changed human heart is what happens. It's about being born again and being adopted into God's family. It's a miraculous thing. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, he established a new pattern of renewal for all of humankind. A new pattern of renewal. A rebirth that leads to an entirely new way of being human. How amazing is that? A rebirth that returns us to a place of intimacy with the Father that hasn't been felt since the very beginning of the world, when God walked in the cool of the evening in the garden with his people. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means. And if we look at this passage, we should notice how involved the Spirit is in the whole process, how it's the Spirit who is empowering and enabling this amazing thing to take place. It's the Spirit that helps us to step into the experience now, the experience of being a child of God, the daily lived reality. It's not like just getting a passport. It's a relationship. And it's the Spirit who makes that happen. You know, it's Christ's work on the cross that makes adoption possible, but it's the work of the Spirit that enables us to really understand what that means, to be a child of God. It helps us to feel the emotional and spiritual force of this intimacy, the ability to call Father Abba, 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 not Yahweh. And I'm not saying God isn't both of those things, but we get to say Ababa, Ababa this morning. We get to lay hold of the idea that the God of the universe, who is all powerful and holy, we can call him Abba. Abba, Abba. You see, the Spirit gives us the language of childhood, He gives us our first words as Christians. You know, the human mind is a miraculous language learning machine. You know that, don't you? It's incredible. Anyone who's had small children knows this is true. The way that children absorb language is phenomenal. Um, I spent some time at university studying how this works, the science of it. It is miraculous how the brain is able to absorb language and codify it and make sense of all this stimulus and come out with an inherent sense of grammar And being able to make sense out of these sounds that we make. It's an incredible thing, isn't it, when you think about it. The gift of language. It's one of the things that makes us uniquely human. The gift of language. You know, you can put a child... um, Sorry, I'm going to go off on one here. Um, One of the things I studied at university was the idea of pigeons and creoles, which are often kind of um, slave language when people of different cultures are brought together. And what happened over generations was they formed their own language. And it was these subsequent generations of children who actually gave grammatical structure to it. And I guess what I'm saying is if you give children broken models of speech, their brains knit it together into a cohesive whole. It's it's incredible what human beings can do when it comes to language learning. It's called uh, the language instinct. It's an inbuilt power of the human brain, entirely subconscious. Aren't we amazing? The fact that you can understand what I'm saying, well, may hopefully understand what I'm saying this morning, that we have this shared language. It's an incredible gift of God. But language is a wonderful illustration, I think, of the work of the Spirit in the new believer. 
You know, the Spirit gives us a Spirit-fueled capacity to learn the language of the Father, beginning with Abba, 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 those first words, the beginning of a relationship built on a shared language, Abba, 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 Abba. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about how he uses words taught by the Spirit. I love that. Spirit-taught language. You know, perhaps one of our prayers this morning might be to ask the Spirit to kind of echo that famous question of the disciples. Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to talk to you. Teach us your language. Help us to speak in a way that we will understand each other better just like little children learning how to ask for a piece of bread. You know, we might say to the Father, I want to speak to you this morning as a child speaks to a parent. I want that intimacy with you. That, I believe, is the Spirit's work in our lives, right from baby Christian, abba, 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 right through to full conversation. I think sometimes... A bit of a challenging idea, I think, for us is that sometimes it's easier for us to think of God as a distant authority. It's easier. What do I mean by that? I think intimacy and closeness, it brings risk. Intimacy carries risk. It carries emotional consequence. It carries emotional consequence. You know, it's actually emotionally safer to keep God at arm's length, to think of Jesus as the man of the cross, not the friend on the beach asking us whether we love him. It's easier to keep Jesus there. And it's easier to keep God somewhere over there rather than saying, Abba, Abba, Abba. Because as children, we're also going to get things wrong. (laughs) And that's difficult. And I think part of the work of the Spirit this morning is to draw us closer into intimacy with our Father. Teaching us his language nudging us to step closer into his embrace. I think that's the work of the Spirit this morning. And I don't know whether any of us here have never known that sense of intimacy with the Father, or perhaps haven't felt that way for a long time, or even we might struggle with the idea that fatherhood is a positive thing because of our stories. And I think if that's us this morning, I would encourage just to ask the Spirit to draw near, Ask the person of the Spirit to draw near and to testify to your Spirit that this is who you are. This is who you are. Ask him to teach you the words of intimacy this morning. Teach the words of intimacy so that we can say, Abba, 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 and then the words that follow. So let's cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father. Let's ask the Spirit to move And tell us that we are children of God this morning. We are reborn. We are renewed. The God of heaven and earth has adopted us into his family. This is the gospel. But if we don't know him this morning, or we've treated this whole Christianity thing as just an intellectual exercise, I've decided to be a Christian, makes sense to me. You know, let this moment be a moment when we ask the person of the Spirit to move in our hearts to speak to us in the whisper or in the thunder, and in so doing, enable us to feel and claim that we are reborn, we are adopted, we are renewed. Amen? Let's pray.